This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. We're coming to you from the absolutely splendid public library in Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is a fitting venue for spending 30 minutes with a librarian. She is Colonel Karen Lloyd, and at the Library of Congress, she is now the commanding officer of the Veterans History Project. Colonel, you spent 28, yeah, that's appropriate because you spent almost three decades in uniform. That's correct, I did. Um, Thanks very much for this time with us. You, you are charged with, your command, as it were, involves one of the most, it has to be one of the most mammoth undertakings the Library of Congress has ever endeavored, and that's to record the stories of America's soldiers, sailors, Marines, military personnel, men, women. That's exactly right, and it's so important. And I really believe it's important um, as a widow of a veteran. My husband never got to tell his story. And what I like is th there, our ability to reach out to, veteran, uh, to volunteers across the nation and ask them to reach out to the veterans in their lives and listen, really listen to their stories. Uh, I bet they'll learn something about those veterans, even if they thought they knew them, that comes as a surprise. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to do, a, do this job. I feel like for the first time I'm giving back. Um, I had all that not time in service, enjoyed it, um, but, but now I really feel like I'm giving back and I have a purpose. And it's, it's, it's fun to go to work every day. I, I tell folks at work I'm living the dream. How many folks can say that? Go down to the granular level, if we can, on what it is the library wants. What are you looking for in these individual stories? What we're looking for is for the veterans to really open up and, and say what their service was like. And it doesn't have to be the worst part. It can be just the best part. It can be why did they join the service. We're looking for 30, uh, at least a minimum of 30 minutes uh, for an oral interview. We're looking for 10 photographs. We're looking for 10 letters. Uh, we are looking for memoirs and journals. We have some amazing uh, diaries that were written by POWs, uh, both in uh, World War II and Vietnam. And it's really fascinating to, to see what they put together in these, do these books, these, these journals they weren't supposed to be keeping. So that's always interesting and fun. It's fun to hear the stories of what they did that you're not going to hear in the unit history. Um, I tell a lot of folks that I feel like the Veterans History Project is the third leg of the stool. The first leg of the stool are the companies that take care of the aircraft history, the services that take care of the unit history, and we're there to take care of that individual history because that's really where the stories are. And if you think about um, some of the movies or the books or the TV shows that they make that use wars as a backdrop, what makes those programs so amazing are the people. And those are the stories that we try to collect so that people will have a place to go, not just the families, but also researchers, to find out what that selfless service was like. What did those soldiers see? What did they hear? What did they do uh, during their service? What did they find fun? What was the food like? I mean, it's really amazing the kinds of things that you, you hear about from these soldiers, um, all the way from World War I to the current conflicts. And it's fun when you are able, the stories start talk, talking to each other. We'll have folks come in that's, that say, my dad served in this unit. Do you have any other soldiers that served in this unit? Maybe they served together. And in fact, we find more often than not that that's what's going on. And so we're very excited when we can uh, add to the collection so that these stories can talk to each other more and more. If, if I'm understanding you correctly, Colonel, you are, the library is as interested, is just as interested in the 
the clerk who maybe did two years at yes. Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and never left Sebastian County, Arkansas, that or is, Crawford County, Arkansas. Yes. As you are, and then separated as a, maybe an E2 yes. after his or her two year enlistment, as you are, you're just as interested in that individual and his rec or her recollections as a frontline warrior in Iraq. That's exactly right, because those folks at the tip of the spear won't be successful without all of that support tail uh, to take care of them. And there's stories in each one of those. Um, I never deployed to war, but as a medevac pilot, I picked up body bags. I know what that's like. I know what it feels like. Um, I was a rear detachment commander, so I know what it's like to be to be be on the home front taking care of the troops and getting them what they need. So we are looking for all of those stories because in each one of those stories there are some real nuggets uh, that tell what it was like and that I think our country and future generations need to hear about and be aware of. What was it like on the chow line? What was a three-day pass good for? What did you do on a three-day pass? That sort of... Exactly. Thing. And you'd be When did amazed. you go to the PX? What were the prices like? In that Exactly, all of those kinds of things because they were different for everyone. I mean, we have one story of um, Alice Dixon. She happened to be from D.C. Uh, she was a, an E-5 tech sergeant with an all-woman's postal service uh, during World War II in Lyon, France. And her job was to make sure packages got through. And one day she found a bottle of whiskey and she got really nervous. She knew she couldn't send it forward, so she went to her captain and said, I found this bottle of whiskey, I don't know what to do with it. And the captain said, leave it here, I'll take care of it. So she felt relieved, went back to work that night. She went to the barracks. She saw her, her, you know, her, her barrack mates, her girlfriends, and said, boy, I had a tough day. I found this bottle of whiskey, I had to do something with it. I, so I took it to the captain, and she said she'd take care of it. And they said, you fool, if you brought it to us, we would have taken care of it too. And so it's those kind of personal stories that we love. Another one that's really a local uh, a soldier is um, Aaron Macon, and I met him about two months ago at the Library of Congress. We're working with the House Administration Committee with the Wounded Warrior Fellowship Project, and we give them a tour of the Jefferson Building, and they then come and see our information center, and also they, we describe for them how to do interviews and ask if they'd like to do an interview. And I happened to sit on his interview, and here is an, a local, a local boy that I, I think did amazing things. He went into the Marines, wanted to be a, report, a, a reporter and, and report from the front. He had the unfortunate uh, luck of being in an, uh, AP, an armored personnel carrier uh, that got blown up by an IED and he was burnt over a large part of his body. And he is the most cheerful person I've ever seen. He his experience really brought home selfless service and how even though he had to go through the burn center um, in, San, in, in San Antonio, how the camaraderie existed between them and how he would do it again because he felt like service to his country was so important. And uh, I, he was just such an amazing person. I had happened to see him last night again and we were just, just talking. And, I can't imagine, I mean, I, can, I think of him when I'm having a bad day and realize how lucky and blessed that I am to be here. But he does it every day, just picks himself up and, and I hope others will have an opportunity to see his interview and understand what an awesome person he is. We have and have long had now an all-volunteer military, even its, despite its vast resources. <clears throat> the Library of the Congress is going to have to rely on volunteers too to get this job done. We certainly are, and we are awfully lucky to have the set of volunteers that we have here in Arkansas. Between Senator Boozman and Bozeman and his um, interest and Senator Cotton and both uh, Representative Hill and Westerman, we are so lucky that we have this amazing cadre of leadership that's interested in reaching out to their veterans and, and hearing their stories. The person that I am so appreciative of is, is Colonel Anita Deason. She has organized the effort here in Arkansas. We have over 1,200 interviews from uh, veterans from the natural state. And it's just amazing to me that the work that they've been able to do uh, recently to get those veterans' histories, because it, it goes back to how can we not lose those voices? And they certainly hear that. And, and it must echo in their, in their minds because of the way that they're going about and getting, getting the different uh, 
uh, volunteers involved. Uh, two that that come to my mind that are that are special that are especially uh, amazing are the Meeks, uh, Jeff and G uh, Jean. Uh, Gene Meeks. They have donated over 400 veteran interviews, which is 25% of those that we have from the state of Arkansas. I mean, big shout out to them for the, for the work that they're doing. But again, you know, the, the, the push behind that, I think, really is, is a Colonel and Anita Deason. I mean, the work that Anita De a Deason is doing just amazes me, it takes my breath away. But it's a work in progress. The work's not done. The work is never done, and our collections are open. And what I love about that is you can start a collection with at one of the minimum levels, perhaps 10 photographs, and then as you find other artifacts or when you, you decide to do that interview, they can be added to your collection, which gives it that breadth and depth. And another new add to our legislation is we're looking for those gold star families. We want those first person narratives from the immediate family for their veterans who are unable to tell their story, who, who what they were like um, because they unfortunately died uh, in combat or injuries as a result of combat. So we think that's a really good new add to our legislation. Um, I had the opportunity to go see, uh, to talk with the gold star wives. Um, and one of my contemporaries talked with the Gold Star Mothers. So we think uh, we're getting the word out, but anything that you could do to, to make sure that those Gold Star families know that we care about their stories and we want to hear the stories of their veterans. It's important. Will you ever declare, will the library ever declare victory on this project? When uh, will it end? What, is there an end? There isn't an end and we can't declare victory. There's over 18 million veterans in the U.S. today and we only have 104,000 stories. There are stories out there everywhere. And I know typically when you go to a veteran and say, I'd like to hear your story, veterans, and I did the same thing, said, I don't really have a story. I mean, there is no I in team. I was a part of a group that made something happen. and. Once they start asking you those questions and you start reminiscing, you'd be surprised what you remember. Mm -hmm. um, I did my interview because I, I, I committed to my team when I was selected last, the end of last October. And I, I, so it's almost been a year now. I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do my, because I had not done my history and, or my oral interview. And I was worried that I was gonna get 30 minutes. And two and a half hours later, it felt like 10 <laughs> minutes. I, I, I couldn't believe the things that I had remembered. And it felt like a blank, but they gave me a copy of my interview. And over the Christmas holidays, I went and listened. And I had remembered things as a part of the questions that the interviewer was asking me that I hadn't thought of in 35 years. And it was just wonderful. And I, I tell that story to encourage veterans to think about their stories and think about things start with things as simple as what was the best part of your military service or what was your training like or what was the food like uh, what were those drill instructors like to get the juices flowing and there's some really good stories in there that you'd be really surprised that you're going to hear um, and so I encourage all I even have a couple of those possibly hopefully uh, some individuals watching this program some of the viewers of this broadcast right now are wondering how can I help how can they how do, how do they get involved what? Well, you can go up our website, um, loc.gov forward slash veterans, and you can, you can, uh, we have a field kit that shows you how to do it. Um, you can uh, call us on the phone and, um, and ask us how to do it. We provide workshops. If you can provide 25 folks a place, we will bring in a trained folklorist to uh, teach you um, how to give an oral interview. Anita is an awesome. Uh, instructor on how to give those interviews as well. We have a Facebook page, so that's something to think about as well. Um, but there is no real excuse. Uh, it's really simple. You've got to be interested. You've got to get a veteran interested. Um, have a camera. It can be as, as simple as your smartphone or tablet where you have a phone. I'd suggest lavalier mics because you want to hear the question and the answer, and that's the best way to do it. Um, and then just sit down. We provide sample questions that you can look at. We have a biographical, biographical information page that if you go through, it talks about what units were you with, where were you assigned, and all of that gets the veterans' juices flowing. And you'd be amazed at the things that they'll think about uh, where, while you're having that discussion. And sometimes, and usually, it's not that first question that gets asked, it's those follow-up questions right. that really 
that tack on to what they said and then asks them to dive just a little bit deeper where you get the really good stuff. What about, Colonel, with veterans who have archival materials of their own, uh, if, if photographs that they brought back from overseas, uh, uh, even souvenirs? Uh, I I'm, use the word cautiously, but I'm so glad that you mementos asked. might be a bit. Exactly. I'm so glad that you asked. We, uh, the library has a world-class preservation conservation lab. We take original materials, for example, send us those original photos, scan that photograph, send us the original. We will have our trained archivists do an assessment of it. If it needs um, uh, either conservation or preservation work, we'll have that accomplished. We'll then put it in with archival material so that when you, your loved ones, or researchers want to come see it, uh, we'll have it in our collection. What I, what I like about our program is you keep your copyrights. So, so when you, if somebody, if a researcher comes in and sees your story and likes your story, they, they have to contact you if they want to use it, writing a book or some other way to make money, um, which we think is really important. Veterans from this current contract uh, conflict, a lot of them have said, well, I don't know that I want to give my story to you because I want to write a book. And my point to them is, give it to us. You keep your copyright and write that book and then add that to our collection as well. How far back do you want to go? For example, there may, uh, plainly there are a lot of descendants of World War I. I think, I think all of our World War I they vets are. have gone. They have. But they have descendants who may have archival material yes. or their own memories of stories that were told them by a yes. doughboy. Or what, where our collection starts with World War I and we ask folks again to send that original material to start that collection. Um, Given that the last World War I uh, veteran has passed away, we would ask them to look for photographs, for journals, for those kinds of archival materials. Sometimes you can find artwork or letters. Oh, the letters. The one thing that makes me sad about what's been going on for the last 30 years is we've been doing everything by email. And so there are no letters. Letters are, are in those emails that most people don't keep. And so we have beautiful letters from World War I and World War II and Korea and Vietnam. And no one but the letter writer and the recipient were intended to see those documents. And to look at the love that's in them, to look at the what happened today, dear, in them is just breathtaking sometimes. But now we have this huge gap. And so I would encourage all of the, the, the viewers to think about, wow, where are those emails that, that I received from a soldier who was downrange or somewhere in the U.S. on military duty that they sent to me and, and not lose them, print them off uh, and make that a part of a collection as well. You're a historian, a librarian, an archivist, and I know from experience that this horrifies historians everywhere, and that's that in this digital age, so much contemporary history is flying right out the window or up into cyberspace, I that's should exactly say, and it's right. being lost. Is the library, is your project taking, obviously you have to be aware of that. Yeah. Are there special well, precautions or procedures that you would urge people to, to follow in preserving the history of service personnel today? Well, that's an interesting question. I think one of the biggest challenges that um, all information services, to include libraries, are having is how good is Born Digital and how do you keep Born Digital? Because we all know that we may have had cassette tapes 20 years ago, but nobody has cassette players today except for right. probably the yeah. Library of Congress. We actually keep the equipment so we can make the materials accessible. Um, and there are certain CDs that you can put your material on them one day and it'll be gone the next. Our preservation lab once a year puts out a special um, uh, information piece that talks to how to keep your, your photographs and the rest of it. If you have photographs that are on CD or thumb drives, you should be changing, uh, you should be transferring those from their current uh, medium to, the, to newer medium at least every five years because the uh, electronic media degrade over that time and you have to be really careful. So many people, and I'm guilty of this, I've got photographs on thumb drives and I have not been as good as I should have been about moving that, that those things forward. Um, but what I like about what we do here at the library, 
uh, to help these archival materials. If you'll bring them to us, again, we have that world-class preservation conservation lab. We'll do the assessment. We'll treat as necessary. So those things will be available. I mean, brittle paper takes so much of history away from us yeah. without even realizing it or knowing it until it's too late. Plus, the current era, it's easy to hit, accidental hit, delete. And oh, my gosh, off. yes. 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 A stop. couple of other things. You, uh, is there a particular focus on the memories and the history of women too often overlooked in uniform? Well, I am really glad you asked that question because women is one of the gaps in our collection. Native Americans are a gap in our collection. Hispanics and also African Americans are all gaps. And we have made a special effort in our outreach travel this year to reach out to those communities. I had the opportunity to go to a Native American powwow uh, last July outside of Chicago. And it was absolutely fascinating for me to see um, what that was all about, but as importantly, to talk with veterans. And what was fun for me was asking them, well, what branch of service were you in? And they would tell me, and I would say, well, I was in the Army. I was an Army aviator. And so what was it like? And their reaction, it broke the ice immediately. And we were going with the National Museum of the American Indian that, Sm that the Smithsonian runs. And they were trying to connect with these different nations and, and Native American tribes. And at the veteran level, I was able to communicate and connect with them because of my service. And then we started laughing about the different stories. What I felt proud about was we actually had four Native Americans choose to let us take their interviews that day. And so uh, we, in the field, under tents, uh, we took four amazing stories of uh, Native American veterans. And something that I learned that I didn't realize uh, before then was when the Native American veterans came back from Vietnam, their tribes welcomed them with open arms. They were embraced by their tribes because their tribes have a warrior uh, culture. And for, their, for the deeds that they did, they earned eagle feathers. I didn't realize that. And then when you, the, you do something extraordinary, you actually are, you, you're given an eagle's head. So they put a staff with an eagle's head on the top right. of it and then all the feathers that they earned coming down the back. And so I had this opportunity not only to learn about these customs, but also to take a lot of pictures uh, while I was there uh, and that we've shared on our Facebook page um, from the Veterans History Project at the library. Yeah. I'm hoping that we can use that to educate others. And then in October, I'm going up to uh, Anchorage to a Native American, well, an Inuit, in fact, um, powwow. Again, I, it's, I'm certain it's going to be an amazing uh, exploration of what their culture is like and how can we chat, reach out to them as well. But if if there are women uh, veterans out there, if there are Native American veterans, if there are Hispanic or African American veterans, we, we desperately want your stories. Those are gaps in our collections. And I'm not saying that to say we don't want everyone's collections because we do. Don't want to lose any voices and that's really, really important. Yeah. One other gap, and I hesitate to call it the niche anyway, but, but it's so much in the news, and that is sexual and gender minorities who have served in the past. Are those histories welcome? You want those as well? We want those as well. We have some amazing examples from all of those folks, and we want those because those are stories about what the military was like before and after, because some of them didn't uh, uh, come out of their closets until after they stopped their service. But it was interesting to hear from them, and others did it while they were in service. So it was in is interesting to see um, how those stories are different and what a difference they made in our service. And, and this question, possibly out of left field, there may be, vet uh, surely there are veterans who would love to tell one or an another aspect, recall one or another aspect of his or her service but are a little reluctant to do so. Has the library considered putting anything under seal? We put, Could you do an oral or visual history and then say, you know, can you sit on this for 10 years? We don't do that, but what we have discovered is, and um, it, we, it's not our preference, but we would ask veterans to get with us, to think about the questions, to do the oral history, and, and uh, hold it till they're comfortable donating to the library. Oh because we're an open archive, but, but there's real goodness into 
after you have a chance to leave service, reminisce, I think of it as marinating, on your service and what it was like. I mean, everybody has a camera. I mean, I shouldn't say everybody. Most folks have cameras on their phones today. What a perfect medium. Get one of those tripods and go up our website, look at the questions that we have. We, ha we are putting together questions because the journey of a Native American or a woman is not the same as, as a, a white male. And so we have different sets of questions that we suggest that you ask those different folks. So what was your journey like? Pick a set of questions that works for you. Do have a friend or do a self-interview. We actually have an interview from a World War I nurse. Uh, and in 1971, well before the program was started, she said to herself, somebody at some point in time in the future is going to want my story. And she recorded 11 hours, self-recorded on a cassette player. And we are fortunate enough that her granddaughter happened to find these materials and donate them to the Library of Congress. But to have that sense of self, and I think everyone who's not comfortable with giving one right away should have that sense of self that, that I have a story, I want to tell it on my own terms and in my own way. And, and the, the equipment is available to you, you probably already have it, to do that interview yourself. And then when you are ready to share it with the world and share it with the library, we would want those collections as well. Thank you for sharing this project with us and your interpretation of it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Colonel Karen Lloyd of the Veterans History Project, Library of Congress. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.